Hello and welcome to Third Thursday at Hoover's. Thank you for joining us this evening. We're sure uh, glad that you could make it tonight. And, and now that uh, there's no reason to watch the NCAA games anymore, uh, this will be a great way to spend your evening. I'm Brad Reiners, the Communications Director at the Hoover Presidential Foundation. We'll begin the program in a few minutes. But first, I have a lot of news to share with you about upcoming events you'll want to participate in. We recently launched a new website called TimelessValuesCampaign.org. And when you visit that site, you'll learn about a major fundraising campaign for the renovation of the Hoover Presidential Library Museum exhibit space. It's been 30 years since the last renovation, and we're excited to bring new technology and other updates into the museum. You'll also learn about a special benefit for Iowa taxpayers who contribute to the Timeless Values campaign and how to earn a 25% Iowa state tax credit for your gift of any size, no matter how much the gift is. I'd like to tell you about two third Thursday programs coming up in April. We've got so many great speakers, sometimes once a month just isn't enough. So we have what we call a third Thursday extra program on April 5th. It features Peter Hanley, a park ranger at the Herbert Hoover National Historic Site and his research on the West Branch area. The title of his presentation is A Prairie Village, Herbert Hoover's West Branch, 1874 to 1885. In it, he'll describe our town as it was when Little Birdie lived here. A regular third Thursday program continues on April 21st with a presentation by author and historian Brandon Little. You can sign up for these programs on our website, hooverpresidentialfoundation.org, with the link under the News and Events tab. Now, tonight, I invite you to enter questions at any time during the program through the Q&A feature you'll find along the edge of your screen. You may also vote for questions someone else has entered if you'd also like to hear those answered. As we might not have time to answer all the questions provided, the top vote getters will get asked first. And we don't monitor the chat window very closely, so the Q&A is the best place for you to go for all your questions and comments. Today's presentation is about the wonder of America's national parks by someone who knows all about their glory. Today's national park system includes 423 different sites, covers more than 85 million acres, and welcomes more than 300 million annual visitors. Park ranger Jenny Cripe Davis is here to present this Land is Your Land, the History of America's National Parks. Jenny has worked for the National Park Service since 2016. She has worked at seven different park sites, including the National Mall and Memorial Parks. She joined us here at the Herbert Hoover National Historic Site last fall and is making her third Thursday debut with us tonight. So welcome, Jenny. Glad you could be here with us. I hear you're kind of a national park junkie and have taken many family trips to the national parks. That is correct, Brad. Well, first of all, thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here. Um, I do love the national parks and I've only been working for them since 2016, as you said. So prior to that, I've, I've spent a lot of time just on my vacationing with family. And, and um, so I've seen quite a few of them and the, the history is fascinating. Super, we're looking forward to your uh, slides and, and presentation tonight. Thank you for having me. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Jenny Cripe Davis. Um, and the name of tonight's program, as Brad said, is This Land is Your Land, the History of the National Parks. I am a park ranger at the Herbert Hoover National Historic Site in West Branch, Iowa. And before I came last fall, I was a ranger at seven other parks. Six of those parks I worked in a seasonal capacity. Um, and then the final two, the most recent two, I've been a permanent park ranger. So I started at Theodore Roosevelt National Park in Medora, North Dakota in 2016, which was the centennial of the National Park Service. This park is where Theodore Roosevelt went when he was a young man after he lost his first wife and his mother on the same day in the same house. He escaped to North Dakota from the East Coast uh, to become a cattle rancher, he thought for the rest of his life. But he also went there to grieve. And while he was in North Dakota, he wrote books and he hiked and he recovered all while he was formulating the basis of his conservation policies um, that impact us still to this day. 
From there, I went to the Lincoln Home National History Site in Springfield, Illinois. This is the home where Abraham Lincoln lived for 17 years before he moved to Washington to become president of the United States. The park is his neighborhood with his home at its heart. The neighborhood is almost entirely original. So the thinking is if President Lincoln were ever able to come back, he would very much recognize the neighborhood. The home itself is loaded with original artifacts and lots of wonderful stories about his important time in Springfield in what, in what would be a very short life. I then went to Mammoth Cave National Park, which is in Kentucky. It is the longest cave in the world and a place that is as beautiful above ground as it is below ground. Mammoth Cave, I think, is really a hidden jewel in the National Park Service and definitely worth a visit, even if you don't think that caves are your thing. I was at spectacular Yosemite National Park where I hiked and hiked and hiked. The scale and splendor of Yosemite is really almost impossible to describe. It really is one of the crown jewels of the National Park Service. It was also special for me to be there working and living in the stomping grounds of conservationist John Muir. His spirit really is all over that park. And Muir is someone that we will be talking about tonight. Then I went up to Mount Rainier National Park, another stunning park, which is an active volcano in the Cascade Mountains of Washington. Five different rivers flow from its glaciated peak, which rises to an impressive height of 14,000 410 feet. The Hamilton Grange National Memorial is the home of founding father Alexander Hamilton, and it is the only memorial in the entire country dedicated solely to preserving his incredible legacy. Hamilton's story is so compelling, almost hard to believe at times because it's so, so compelling, but his contributions to the country were immense. It really was an honor to work there. And then finally, and most recently, I served as a permanent ranger at Ford's Theater and throughout the National Mall and Memorial Parks in Washington, DC. Now, because of the different periods of history represented around the National Mall, this is a, a great park to work in, um, especially if you love history. So I love the National Parks and it has really been one of my greatest joys in life to represent so many of these important and special places. Everybody needs beauty as well as bread, places to play in and pray in, where nature may heal and give strength to body and soul alike. This natural beauty hunger is made manifest in our magnificent national parks, nature's sublime wonderlands, the admiration and joy of the world. John Muir. The national parks have been called America's best idea and the national parks are uniquely American, part of the country's landscape and psyche, places for recreation, renewal, and learning. But this has not always been the case. Just like the founding of the country itself, the national park system is an ongoing and unprecedented experiment, a 150 year arc of successes and missed opportunities that have collectively shaped what is today a shining example for the world. Since the first tract of land was preserved by the federal government, the National Park Service has grown to 423 different sites across all 50 states, the District of Columbia, American Samoa, Puerto Rico, Guam, and the Virgin Islands. The National Park System encompasses over 85 million acres and is packed with some of the country's most spectacular scenery. It preserves some of our rich cultural heritage. And the MPS tells the stories of some of our most significant historical moments, both good and bad. But it is likely that some of these places might have otherwise been lost to us had it not been for the hard work of countless individuals from all walks of life and backgrounds whose selfless efforts have built an incredibly diverse menu of sites around the nation. 
There have been so many important moments in the history of the National Park Service, way too many for the time we have tonight. So this program is really an attempt to break it down into a handful of pivotal events. These moments involve people, places, and congressional acts that have all played a significant part in creating the National Park Service that we know today. Among the many successes, there have also been failures. And one of the more obvious examples of this occurred before the Civil War, when one of the country's most visited and most famous natural wonder was ruined by commercial development. A lack of oversight left Niagara Falls open to the greed of developers. At this point in history, America was still a young country, just 85 years old, and still viewed as an experiment in democracy. The degradation of Niagara Falls made us the laughing stock of Europe. Europeans were appalled at how Americans treated their natural treasures. One tourist wrote, they don't know how to appreciate that which makes them unique. Then in the midst of the country's greatest conflict, in the shadows of a series of critical battles that produced tens of thousands of casualties in May and June of 1864, President Abraham Lincoln signed the Yosemite Grant Act. The bill set aside a large tract of natural scenery for the future enjoyment of everyone, described as containing some of the greatest wonders of the world. It was an opportunity to prevent another Niagara Falls. It was the first time in the history of the world that land was designated and preserved for public use, resort, and recreation. The bill established Yosemite Valley and the Mariposa Grove of giant sequoia trees as protected wilderness areas. President Lincoln was signing to protect a beautiful valley and a grove of trees in the Sierra Mountain that he had never seen. It was a radical concept seen today as the birth of the National Park Service. This federal bill gave the state of California the right and responsibility to manage these pristine wilderness areas. Eight years later in 1872, when President Ulysses S. Grant signed the Yellowstone National Park Protection Act, the country welcomed its first true national park. Yellowstone couldn't be managed by the states it was in like Yosemite had been because Montana, Idaho and Wyoming were still territories. So in order to protect this wonderland of wildlife, geothermal features and spectacular natural beauty encompassed in an area larger than the states of Rhode Island and Delaware combined, Yellowstone fell under the authority of the federal government becoming the world's first national park. Yellowstone celebrates its 150th anniversary this year. Happy birthday, Yellowstone. By 1902, there were five national parks. However, there was no regulating agency overseeing them, no funding to maintain them, and no means of protecting what had been preserved. And this left the door open to unscrupulous behavior, such as poaching, illegal foresting, squatting, and stealing. And at this point, most Americans didn't even know what a national park was. Therefore, over the next several decades, many individuals had to work to change that. The first two that we will discuss rise to the top as indispensable in the development of the national park system. John Muir and Theodore Roosevelt left an indelible mark on the country's landscape and laid a foundation for preservation and conservation on which the National Park Service is built. And I love this cartoon because we've got John Muir and Theodore Roosevelt looking at the mountain goat. Now this is a historic cartoon from the early 1900s and the mountain goat are looking back. So back then it was so unique to be looking at wildlife that the wildlife actually looked back at you. Not so much anymore. John Muir was one of the first voices of preservation advocating for some of the country's most spectacular scenery, Yosemite, Mount Rainier, Glacier. His passion took him on long walks throughout these places, sometimes for weeks at a time. 
where he would contemplate man's relationship to nature. He concluded that all life forms have inherent significance and the right to exist. He also realized the fragility of nature and how people's impact on the land was slowly destroying the beauty in our wilderness areas. He used his prolific writing skills and his passion for nature to generate articles and books that quickly became widely read. He raised awareness of the need to protect any pristine wilderness that still existed before it was gone. When one tugs at a single thing in nature, he finds it attached to the rest of the world. John Muir. Vice President Theodore Roosevelt became the 26th president in 1901 when President William McKinley was assassinated. The only president born and raised in Manhattan, Roosevelt grew up a sickly child, believe it or not, protected by his loving and affluent parents. As a young adult, he turned that around, working and willing himself back to strength and good health, living what he called the strenuous life of hunting, riding, hiking, birding, and camping in the great outdoors. In 1903, President Roosevelt toured the country for two months, traveling 14,000 miles. Two of his stops proved to be pivotal for the National Park Service. Theodore Roosevelt visited the Grand Canyon for the first time in May of 1903. And like most people, he was awestruck by what he saw. He said to the people of Arizona, leave it as it is. Man cannot improve it, not a bit. The ages have been at work on it and man can only mar it. His second significant stop was at John Muir's beloved Yosemite where the two men had three days together with just a few staff members accompanying them as they camped, hiked and talked about the future of such places. They shared the pure joy of being out in nature together and Roosevelt took to heart Muir's passion for conservation. The trip would cement the two as lifelong comrades and would boost Roosevelt's urgency for protecting these fragile and unique places. We have fallen heirs to the most glorious heritage a people ever received, and each one must do his part if we wish to show that the nation is worthy of its good fortune. Theodore Roosevelt. But while people like Roosevelt and Muir were attempting to build a coalition of supporters, spreading the word about the need to protect these vast natural wonderlands, others were exploiting and tearing them apart. One such example happened at Mesa Verde in Colorado. It was the largest concentration of cliff dwellings that had ever been discovered. The ancient homes had been built and occupied by the Pueblo Indians 1,000 years earlier, and then they were mysteriously deserted. Early discoverers said that the homes were undisturbed and looked as though their occupants had just stepped out for a quick minute. And as soon as the site was found, the artifacts that were all throughout these ancient homes started to disappear. One such example became a national story when it was discovered that a Swedish archeologist had amassed hundreds of items, carefully excavating, labeling, and packing them all with plans to send them back to Scandinavia. When he showed up at the train station in Colorado with the goods, he was arrested. However, there was no law against what he had done, so he couldn't be stopped. America had lost an irreplaceable piece of history to another country. And this woke the nation up to the tragic fact that these treasures had been completely unprotected. Because of this travesty and the public outcry for change, Congress acted. It was Iowa Senator John F. Lacey who proposed the Act for Preservation of American Antiquities, written to prevent the destruction of Indian archeological sites and to stop people from stealing artifacts from them. It would become known as the Antiquities Act and it gave the president the exclusive authority without any congressional approval needed to set aside land not as national parks, but as national monuments. It was a law that was designed to preserve places not for majestic natural scenery, but instead to save prehistoric cultures and their people. In that same spirit, and just 21 days later, 
Congress established Mesa Verde as a national park, the first of its kind, set aside to preserve the works of man. Mesa Verde with 600 cliff dwellings was now protected. And to the good fortune of all future generations, when the Antiquities Act was enacted in 1906, Theodore Roosevelt was president and he wasted no time in using his new authority. Roosevelt himself invoked the Antiquities Act 18 times over a three year period, securing such national gems as the Petrified Forest, Chaco Canyon and Devil's Tower, the country's first national monument. But the clock was ticking. Roosevelt had his eye on the grand prize and had been working for years to try to persuade Congress to establish the Grand Canyon as a national park. Because it was unprotected, it was being developed, ranched, and exploited. Concessioners were even charging visitors to hike some of the best trails in the canyon. However, the interests fighting against preservation were too powerful, even for Theodore Roosevelt. So, frustrated by Congress's inability to make it a national park, and with this newfound presidential authority, Roosevelt stretched the limits of the Antiquities Act. The law was worded, to protect objects of historic and scientific interest. And in January, 1908, TR declared the 806,000 acres of the Grand Canyon to be an object of unusual scientific interest, being the greatest eroded canyon in the US. And with the stroke of his presidential pen, he designated the Grand Canyon as a national monument. Roosevelt was blasted by Arizona politicians and other powerful interests in the state who were outraged, believing that the president had overstepped his authority. But Roosevelt didn't flinch. He was ahead of his time in his understanding that it was necessary to shoulder any short-term controversy because it would lead to the long-term benefit of the people, both spiritually and economically. Today, there aren't too many people who would argue with the value of the Grand Canyon, which became a full-fledged national park in 1919. A study showed that the 6.3 million visitors to the canyon in 2018 spent $947 million in communities near the park. That spending supported almost 13,000 lo local jobs and had a cumulative benefit of $1.2 billion to the local economy in 2018. To this day, the Antiquities Act remains the most powerful conservation tool a president has in his arsenal. And it has enjoyed bipartisan application throughout its 116 year history. While president, Theodore Roosevelt created five new national parks, 51 federal bird sanctuaries, four national game refuges, 18 national monuments, and set aside more than 100 million acres of national forest. He preserved more land than any other president. Meanwhile, John Muir was in the fight of his conservation life and the results would have a lasting impact on the National Park Service and the country. The great wilds of our country, once held to be boundless and inexhaustible, are being rapidly invaded and overrun in every direction. Every landscape low and high seems doomed. John Muir. For years, the conservationists who wanted to protect John Muir's beloved Hetch Hetchy Valley, <clears throat> excuse me, in Yosemite National Park had been successful against people in the state of California who wanted instead to dam the valley to create a new and reliable source of drinking water. However, when the San Francisco city was rocked by a devastating and deadly earthquake in 1906, the forces against Muir became too strong. Even Roosevelt had to concede in a letter to Muir that even though he would do everything in his power to protect the great natural beauties of this country, it would be difficult without a certain degree of friendliness toward them on the part of the people in the state in which they are situated. Ultimately, it was decided that a dam and reservoir in the Hetch Hetchy Valley was necessary and that it would bring the greater good to the greater number of people. In 1913, Congress passed a law that approved the construction of the dam in Hetch Hetchy Valley. 
Completely exhausted from the defeat and sickened by the thought of his beloved Hachachi destroyed, Muir retreated from political life. He died a year later. Some believe it was the defeat at Hachachi that killed him. The enemies of nature are invincible and they are everywhere, but the fight must go on. For every acre that you gain, 10,000 trees and flowers and all of the other forest people and the usual unborn generations will rise up and call you blessed. John Muir. John Muir saw what America could be if we were thoughtful and intentional in our efforts at preserving those natural areas that make the country so unique. And for a century, many fought him back. But Muir's defeat at Hetch Hetchy struck a chord with many Americans as we, <clears throat> excuse me, as we realized that places like this needed more protection. It was a critical turning point for the National Park Service because a beautiful and supposedly protected valley had been flooded. It was lost. A proposal that Muir had supported was now gaining ground around the nation to create a single agency whose sole job it was to protect the parks. By 1914, the national park idea had expanded, but there was still no master plan. The national parks had started very improvisationally. It was an unintentional patchwork of various landscapes that individual people had lobbied to protect. And this haphazard evolution was affecting how the federal government was managing the parks. Some parks were policed by the military, others were completely under civilian control, while others were nearly unmanaged. And at the federal level, the responsibilities were divided between three different agencies, the Departments of Interior, Agriculture, and War. The national park idea was almost 50 years old, but there was still a lot of unprotected landscapes all around the country that were in jeopardy. The solution to these issues was becoming clear. The parks needed their own federal agency to oversee them. Then along came Stephen Mather, a wealthy businessman who knew from his personal experience that being in nature made him healthier. He was disgusted by what he saw at Yosemite and Sequoia National Parks with cattle grazing and loggers cutting down the ancient trees. He wrote to the Secretary of Interior and complained. Mather received a letter back that said, well, if you don't like the way the parks are being managed, why don't you come and do the job yourself? So he did. Mather was the right man at the right time. He was a millionaire with connections and he cared about the parks. Mather often used his own money to make improvements to park roads, to hire staff and to cover his travel expenses. Mather also purchased land and donated it back to the National Park Service for protection. And he didn't hesitate to invite others to do the same. He used his energy, passion, and talents to launch a national marketing campaign to bring people to the parks. And he partnered with the railroads to make it easier for them to bring the tourists. Mather understood that to prevent another Hetch Hetchy, the public needed to see for themselves what was at stake. He was creating a larger network of supporters who would advocate for his belief that a new federal agency was needed to oversee the management and administration of the country's national parks. And his efforts worked. In 1916, President Woodrow Wilson signed the Organic Act, creating the National Park Service, the agency that was now responsible for protecting America's national parks and monuments. The Organic Act asked the agency to conserve the scenery and the natural and historic objects and the wildlife therein by such means as will leave them unimpaired for the enjoyment of future generations. Mather was officially appointed to lead the new agency, which now sat exclusively within the Department of Interior. He served as the first director of the National Park Service from 1916 until his death in 1929. Another person who made significant contributions to the development of America's national parks and served as the second director of the National Park Service was Horace Albright. Albright was the first person who Stephen Mather hired in 1915, and he was a loyal assistant to Mather throughout his tenure. 
whereas Mather was the energetic and passionate silver tongue promoter. Albright was the more quiet behind the scenes administrator who was effective in navigating government structure, could write policy and correspondence of all kinds, and was also persuasive in the political halls of Washington, DC. Albright greatly admired Mather and was fiercely loyal to him. Albright quietly served as the acting director during a two year period when Mather was recovering from a severe bout of depression that incapacitated him. Albright continued his strong partnership with Mather even after he became the superintendent at Yellowstone National Park in 1918. When Herbert Hoover became president in 1929, he persuaded his old friend Albright to return as the director of the National Park Service. The two men had known one another since Hoover's early days as the head of the US Food Administration during World War I. This is when Albright came to Hoover looking for help in opposing the killing of elk in Yellowstone for the purpose of feeding the soldiers. Hoover agreed with Albright that the National Parks did not need to be exploited for this purpose. And from that point forward, the two shared a mutual admiration, as well as some of the same views on conservation. And Hoover, like Muir, Roosevelt, Mather, and Albright, loved the great outdoors. Albright and Hoover fished together whenever the, the opportunity arose. Growing up in a Quaker family right here in West Branch, Iowa, Herbert Hoover was encouraged to spend his free time outside, which was believed to improve physical health moral fiber, and spiritual understanding. Hoover's impact on the National Park Service started during his seven years as the Secretary of Commerce, post-World War II. During this period, Americans had higher incomes, more leisure time, and Secretary Hoover encouraged American workers to live balanced and meaningful lives. As an ardent fisherman, Hoover was convinced that others, if given the chance, would also prefer fishing and other activities in the natural world to any type of commercial entertainment. So he advocated for this, believing that time in the great outdoors would ward off societal degeneration. Hoover felt that if Americans could learn to use leisure time to their moral and spiritual advantage, they would reaffirm the values that he saw as being threatened by a growing consumer culture. As president during the Great Depression, outdoor recreation was an inexpensive option for struggling families. The low cost of camping combined with the growing car culture combined contributed to an increase in visitors to the national parks. President Hoover responded to this by establishing 19 new national sites, increasing the acreage of the National Park Service by 40%. He also added land to a dozen already existing national parks and monuments, such as Scott's Bluff, Bandelier, Carlsbad Caverns, and Bryce Canyon. And he laid the groundwork for the addition of four new national parks, Mammoth Cave, the Great Smoky Mountains, the Everglades, and Shenandoah, were all established to meet the demand in the higher populated areas east of the Mississippi. One of the ways that the Hoovers contributed to the establishment of Shenandoah National Park was through the donation of their own Camp Rapidan. Camp Rapidan was a 13 building compound that the Hoovers paid for, developed and used for what was the first complex specifically designed to be a presidential retreat. Camp Rapidan gave the first family a weekend escape to the mountains and to the Rapidan River where they relaxed, fished, and often worked. A few buildings still remain today and are preserved inside of Shenandoah National Park. Hoover also oversaw the creation of Waterton Glacier, the world's first international peace park, a merger of two adjacent Rocky Mountain parks on each side of the US-Canada border. The purpose of the merger was to commemorate the long existing relationship of peace and goodwill between the two countries. Hoover's impact on the national park system left a legacy that has outlasted much of his vision for America that didn't survive the Great Depression. Boris Albright would remain the director of the National Park Service throughout 
Hoover's presidency. Albright would serve under the next president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, for just five months, but it was long enough to create another significant event in the evolution of the National Park Service. It was the culmination of a campaign that had begun in the early 20th century to consolidate the administration of all federal parks and monuments. In the reorganization of 1933, FDR transferred the care of national monuments from the Department of Agriculture to the National Park Service. He transferred the care of military parks from the War Department to the National Park Service. And he also moved the National Capitol Parks, which included the National Mall, then managed by a separate office in Washington to the National Park Service. In all, the 1933 organization led to the National Park Service gaining 57 new units, a majority of which were east of the Mississippi, which helped to provide balance to the West heavy map of sites. Now there was a single system of federal parklands, truly national in scope, embracing historic as well as natural places. This solidified the National Park Service as the keeper of both the natural and cultural heritage of the United States. Another significant contribution that Franklin Roosevelt made to the National Park Service came as a result of the creation of the Civilian Conservation Corps, the CCC, one of the, his administration's New Deal programs designed to provide relief to the nearly 13 million unemployed. The CCC put young men to work in state and national parks and state and national forests. Throughout the Great Depression, three million men would find work through the CCC. In the national parks, there was $218 million worth of projects done that included the improvements of trails and the construction of buildings, many that remain in parks to this day. Now this is a modern day oil and gas development just outside of Theodore Roosevelt National Park in North Dakota. And this quote from Franklin Roosevelt is really part of the story of the National Park Service. We should remember that the development of our national park system over the period of many decades has not been a simple bed of roses. It has been a fierce fight against many private interests which were entrenched in political economic power. So we've heard this same message now from Muir and Roosevelt in the early 1900s. We're hearing it from Franklin Roosevelt in the 1940s and we're looking at an image that is from today. So this is this constant trying to balance of conservation versus development is really an ongoing issue. But the country continued to persevere and add national park sites. By the end of FDR's presidency, there were more than 150 sites and a thriving agency to manage them all. The country continued to evolve in its understanding and its protection of these lands and the responsibility involved in caring for them. Policy shifted, science was now being used more in the management of the parks and more citizens were visiting and cherishing these various sites. And for the first time in our history, the US government had used its own money to buy land for a national park. When one point, one point, excuse me, $1.5 million in federal money was secured to make up a shortfall that was needed to purchase the remaining land to establish the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. The next several decades would bring the country closer to its national parks with increases in visitation and the number of sites established. In 1947, the Everglades were established as a national park. It was the first time in history that a park had been created solely for the preservation of animals and plants and the environment that sustains them. In the 1950s, a comfortable middle class took to the roads as more Americans owned a car. The rise of the automobile led to an increase in the visitation to the national parks. And in the 1960s, the National Park Service established more urban parks, more national lakeshores and national seashores. In the late 1960s, the NPS moved towards more deliberate 
and science-based policies on wildlife and nature. We now understood that it was important to leave wildlife wild and stunts like the practice of feeding bears stopped. In 1980, with the last bit of wilderness left in the United States being threatened by the development and other commercial interests, President Jimmy Carter signed a sweeping piece of legislation in Alaska. It set aside over 104 million acres of land, nearly half to be managed by the National Park Service. The acreage preserved by this act more than doubled the size of the national park system and dramatically increased the total acreage designated as wilderness. 2016 was the centennial of the National Park Service and Barack Obama was president. His signature preservation move was to enlarge the Pacific Remote Islands National Monument. This had been established by President George W. Bush in 2006. President Obama made it the largest marine reserve in the world encompassing more than 490,000 square miles of open ocean, coral reef, and island habitats. Both of these conservation acts, where hundreds of thousands of acres of water and land were conserved, are a reflection of just how far the country had come in its understanding of the importance of balancing development with preservation. It is proof that we had learned something from past mistakes. The person who is incapable of making mistakes is incapable of anything, Abraham Lincoln. So I'd like to start the process of wrapping up the program with just a few fun facts about today's National Park Service. The smallest national park site in the country is the Thaddeus Kosciusko National Memorial in downtown Philadelphia. It's a, a whopping 0.2 acres. The largest national park site is Wrangell St. Elias National Park and Preserve in Alaska. At 13.2 million acres, it's larger than the country of Switzerland. The top three most visited national park sites in 2021 were the Blue Ridge Parkway at close to 16 million people, the Great Smoky Mountains, just over 14 million people, and the Golden Gate National Recreation Area at 13 and a half million. The 423 national park sites are yours. Enjoy them, keep up with them on social media, and perhaps you will find the time this year to visit one that is on your bucket list. And what better way to close the program than with another epic quote from John Muir. Keep close to nature's heart and break clear away once in a while. Climb a mountain or spend a week in the woods. Wash your spirit clean. I hope you've enjoyed the program and I'm happy to try to answer um, any questions that may have come up. There are a couple of questions out there, Jenny. Thank you for a great, interesting program. Um, I wanna remind everybody, if you do have questions, you can use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen or along the edge of your screen to to enter those questions and we'll get to those um, in short order. I have a question for you, Jenny. Do you have a favorite park? That's a really good question. And I, I always kind of go to the ones that I've worked at because I, I feel like I know those the best. And I liked all of the parks that I've worked at for different reasons. But I think one that was especially special to me was the Hamilton Grange National Memorial um, in New York City. I think Alexander Hamilton's story and his contributions are really just so staggering. And I, I feel like he is, has been shortchanged prior to the musical. So the musical um, Hamilton, the Broadway musical Hamilton has really put him in the mainstream, but it's taken this long for that to happen. So um, the house is special. It's the only memorial, as I said, dedicated to his legacy and um, he lived in it for two years before he was killed in a duel. And then his wife, Eliza, and their large family, she lived there another 30 years. And so a lot of this history of the house is, is the family's. But his fingerprints are all over the house. And some of the design, he designed the whole thing. And 
Um, the seventy percent original, so it's it was pretty solidly made. So anyway, I'm partial to that, but I love all of the national parks. Honestly, you cannot go wrong. I always say, cannot go wrong visiting yeah. a national park. So when you when you're at a, a park and uh, on your own time, not working, uh, what's your favorite park activity? Is it hiking or photography or what is it that you like to do at the park? Yeah. Yeah, the hiking. I definitely like to hike. I think it's the best way to see the park and you can get into areas that aren't as populated. So, um, you know, part of the car culture um, that started right right in the 1950s um, meant more visitors to the park, but it also meant that those visitors um, started to make an impact on the national parks. So Yosemite, for example, the valley itself, which is really kind of the showcase of a pretty big park, is seven miles long and two miles wide. And there's one way in and there's one way out. And so it's a zoo. On busy summer days, it's like trying to find a parking spot in New York City. Like it's just really kind of crazy. So the best way to get away from all of that is to hike. And there's trails that come up from the valley on all sides. Um, you can also drive up to one of the areas above the valley and hike down into it. So I like to hike and I always have a camera around my neck when I hike. Um, so I can capture some some of the prettiness of the parks. Mm -hmm. And when you were talking about the, the Pueblos, uh, Barbara asks, did Sweden ever return those artifacts that, mm -hmm. that they made off with? No, they are in Europe and they are dispersed amongst uh, several different museums. So it was a pretty hard lesson that the country had to, had to face. Um, and it's quite a story. This archeologist really, he was very, careful. I mean, to his credit, he really understood the value of what they had found. And he trained some of the local ranchers how to, ex how to properly excavate some of the artifacts from the site so as not to damage them. And they were careful to, to package them and to catalog the artifacts because he knew how, how valuable they were. So they're all in Europe, again, in, in different museums. Um, and a couple of the pieces did end up back in DC at the Smithsonian, but just a couple. So um, again, but that led to the passing of the Antiquities Act, which you know was the beginning of a lot of conservation and preservation. So a lot of our lessons that we've learned through the past led to led to positive things, and that was one of them. That conservation is uh, quite a big deal with the Park Service. I know here at the Hoover campus. Uh, we've had different events on the park property where we wanted to do something and before we could disturb the ground an archaeological team easy for me to say they would have to come in and survey the ground and, and do a, a dig to see if to make sure that we weren't uh, disturbing anything yeah the national park service so when i worked in washington dc there's a whole department that's called the permit department and so the National Mall, of course, is a one gigantic First Amendment space. But in order to use it properly, you need to apply for a permit. Um, and, and permits are very rarely turned down. But once there is a permit that's been issued, the permits department, and sometimes the rangers help as well, we have to monitor the activity to make sure that they're following the guidelines of the permit so as not to you know, ruin the mall. Mm -hmm. um, and there's really strict requirements as far as where you can park vehicles, where you can drive vehicles, what you can unload on the grass, um, et cetera. So it's definitely a concern um, as it should be. And it's not just the mall, it's a, a, a lot of parks that have activities, weddings, things like that um, have to be permitted. Mm -hmm. you know, we have uh, Hoover's hometown days every year here, the first weekend of August. And I am the guy who has to fill out the permits so that we can do our Hoover ball games and and things in the in the park area, and Seth uh, Goodspeed, he's uh, one of the park rangers in charge of the security and the permits and things like that. It's always a big help and make sure that we uh, are following the rules and and uh, doing it safe and and uh, it, it's never been an issue. We've we've always uh, had a great time during Hoover's Hope Tide days. Uh, Barbara has another question: uh, Have there ever been any national parks that have been removed from the park system? Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, Herbert Hoover, I can find my list here. He had a, a couple that he created as national park sites, and then they were, they were 
they actually weren't removed. They were consolidated with another park, um, which is a good thing because it meant that there was more land that was being preserved. Mm -hmm. um, Are there other parks that uh, we'd like to get preserved but not uh, have, haven't been turned into national parks yet? Boy, I'm, I'm sure there are. Um, I, I'm probably in Alaska. I'm not, I can't, I don't know the, the exact right answer to that question, but I'm going to guess that yes, there probably are. Um, national parks have to be approved by Congress, um, which is why the National Monuments and the Antiquities Act is so helpful because a president can create a national monument without Congress. So it can preserve, which is what Roosevelt was the master of. Uh, Hoover, every president since Roosevelt with the exception of three, used the Antiquities Act to some degree. Hoover used it extensively. Roosevelt did, both Roosevelt's did. Um, so I guess where I'm going with this is a national park, because it's congressionally approved, it gets the benefit of funding and special protections that don't necessarily come with the national monument. And money's the big, the big one. Mm -hmm. So uh, in your presentation, you also talked about camping and uh, how that's a very popular activity uh, within the national parks and such. So I have an RV and I'm wondering what top three parks would you suggest that I would want to go to with my RV for camping? Well, wow. Or even one. Mount Rainier, for sure. In fact, I want to go back someday with uh, some kind of a camper and camp in each of the four campsite campgrounds because mm -hmm. each campground park is big. Each campground is in a different part of the park. And from each campground, there's all kinds of different trails. So definitely Mount Rainier. Mount Rainier is really stunning. And I didn't realize how pretty it was until I got there. You know, somebody you kind of know it's a pretty place, but Mount Rainier, I feel like is kind of underappreciated for how much beauty it is. It's also very diverse. It actually has uh, an old growth forest that is an old rainforest in the north uh, west corner of the park. Kind of hard to get to it. It has its own entrance. But so I would say Mount Rainier, um, Rocky Mountain National Park is another nice park to camp in, mm -hmm. especially if you can hit it like in September when the elk are bugling and the aspen are starting to turn gold. Um, that's a really special place. Acadia National Park in Maine. Mm -hmm. um, try to avoid the summer again because it's pretty busy up there in the summertime. But that's a really interesting park, really beautiful. And if I had had more time in my program, I would have talked a little bit about John D. Rockefeller. So he was pretty significant in that he was himself very wealthy. And he was a philanthropist and he liked to use his money to purchase land to create national parks. And in Acadia, he was the one who really pulled together his wealthy friends who all had cottages up, up in, along the main coast to get them to donate the land back to create the park. Um, he also was involved in establishing the Grand Tetons and he did this with the help of Horace Albright. Horace Albright was really passionate about trying to get the Grand Tetons preserved. Grand Tetons are right, right below Yellowstone. Um, so anyway, Acadia's got some interesting history and they've got carriage roads throughout the park that were really carriage roads for the wealthy people that had cottages on that land. The park service has preserved those to use for biking. Mm -hmm. So hopefully that's helpful. Yeah, well, it, it caused a, uh, a text storm here. I have a, a question. This is going to be our last question for tonight, but uh, Faith would like to know, she says, I don't have an RV, so uh, <laughs> what would be uh, a top place for me to go where we can just drive and you know plenty of lodging things like that to do yeah i mean i i am a big fan of staying in the parks um and a lot of the national parks have really beautiful historic inns um really beautiful places that you can stay now they 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 carry a price tag um and you do have to reserve well ahead to to get a room especially during the busier seasons same is true for campsites as well though actually um so I'm thinking of Yellowstone with the Old Faithful Inn, which is just spectacular. And you literally walk out and there's Old Faithful. 
Um, so you can be the first there, well, first one there in the morning with your coffee in hand before the crowds come. Um, Shenandoah National Park on the East Coast is, is, is long, right? It's a, I think it's 70 miles north to south, Skyline Drive. And then from Skyline Drive, there's all kinds of trails um, that filter off. In fact, to get to Camp Rapidan, you hike a couple, about two and a half miles off of Skyline Drive down to see the, the compound, which I actually did with a couple of friends in DC awesome. right before I left to come here. Awesome. Um, so really, Glacier has some beautiful hotels, um, Rocky Mountain. Um, I'm trying to think of parks that I haven't talked about. Of course, the Grand Canyon, because it was exploited before, <laughs> before Roosevelt made it a national monument. So it's got, but their lodges are, are tasteful and, and nice there as well. But I really encourage people watching if you're interested, like the National Park Service sites have great websites. And get on the website and learn if you're on Facebook or any sort of social media, you know, like some of these sites, because I like a ton of them. And it's really fun to see those pretty pictures come through and hear about events that they're doing and, and any issues that may be happening. And it's a great way to just stay connected to the parks, which really, as I said, they are our parks. They belong to all of us, um, which is pretty cool. Well, that's great. Great information and, and uh, great advice, too. Uh, but that's all the time we have for questions now. And I, I'd like to thank our speaker, Ranger Jenny Cripe Davis, for her presentation tonight. And also to all the public libraries who helped make tonight's program a great success. So remember the Presidential Library is now open Tuesdays through Saturdays from nine to five with time ticketing. Our current temporary exhibit is called Hoover Heads featuring numerous, numerous original artworks that capture the likeness of Herbert Hoover. Now also the National Historic Site and the historic buildings and visitor center are also open seven days a week for you to enjoy and explore. And don't forget to join us again then on Tuesday, April 5th, as another National Historic Site Ranger, Peter Hangley presents a Prairie Village, Herbert Hoover's West Branch, 1874 to 1885. Registration is now open for that program on hooverpresidentialfoundation.org or through your favorite public library. Now, uh, the Hoover Presidential Foundation staff is ready to assist you with your membership needs or charitable gifts in support of the Hoover campus and museum renovation. You can learn more about that and even show your support at timelessvaluescampaign.org. So on behalf of all of us at the Hoover campus and the participating public libraries, we thank you for joining us and look forward to your next visit to the Hoover campus. <laughs>